Hi everyone, welcome to today's webinar on MSK Ultrasound, presented by Dr. Lev Nazarian. At the conclusion of this webinar, participants should be able to discuss the general applications for ultrasound in the MSK system and identify the sonographic appearances of normal MSK structures and common pathologies. The AIUM is accredited by the ACCME. This webinar is designated for one AMA PRA Category 1 credit. Credits for this webinar are approved for physicians, sonographers, and radiologic technologists. Participants who complete the post-test with a grade of 70% or higher will be awarded one CME credit. As an ACCME accredited provider, it is the AIUM's policy to ensure that the contents and quality of this activity are balanced, independent, objective, and scientifically rigorous. All individuals who are in a position to control the content of an educational activity are required to complete a disclosure form. All disclosures are reviewed by the AIUM and any conflicts of interest are resolved or managed prior to an activity. Dr. Nazarian has no disclosures. AIUM staff members and individuals involved with planning this activity have no disclosures. During today's presentation, if you have questions for the presenter, you may type them into the question box on the right side of your screen. You will be able to submit questions throughout this webinar, but the presenter will not begin answering until the end of the presentation, at which time he will answer as many questions as possible. A recording of this webinar will be available on the AIUM website. And now, we're pleased to present Dr. Lev Nazarian. Okay, thank you for that introduction, Kathy, and hello, everybody. So, the purpose of today's webinar is to introduce you to musculoskeletal ultrasound, a field that has been really growing in popularity recently, and with good reason. Now, why musculoskeletal ultrasound, given the other types of imaging tests that are available? First of all, it's a low-cost tool, and in this era of cost containment, that's a very important benefit of ultrasound compared to, for example, MRI. It has few technical limitations. You can get good studies on just about everybody. You can perform real-time dynamic studies and interventions, and this real-time nature is a very major advantage of ultrasound. It also has better spatial resolution than MRI, and <clears throat> this is something that we take advantage of every day in our clinic. For example, even if you're just using a 10 megahertz probe on ultrasound, your resolution is about 150 microns. Now, I looked at our protocol for shoulder MRI, and the resolution is about 450 microns, so literally, the spatial resolution for a 10 megahertz probe is about three times as good as the MRI. Now, of course, we have now transducers that are 12, 15, 20, et cetera, megahertz, so we can even go below the 100 micron level, and that's something that shows you very fine details and can really make the difference in making a diagnosis. Now, of course, technique is critical in, in MSK ultrasound. We want to use generally high-frequency linear transducers. 10 megahertz or higher, usually our probes are now 12 to 15 megahertz. However, if we need uh, better penetration because of a large body habitus or a deeper structure such as the hip joint, we will uh, go down to a 5 megahertz, usually curve a linear probe. Uh, but if we're for tendon imaging or ligament imaging, we really want to stay in the linear zone. Now, there are certain other technical factors that are very useful. I'll just list a couple here. Compound imaging, which is a speckle reduction technique. It goes by different brand names depending on the company. And that is something that can be very useful in producing a better MSK ultrasound image. Tissue harmonics is something that can be also useful from time to time in order to improve our resolution. It's also very important to have an anatomic reference handy. If you go to the website that's listed there, you'll see some very nice primers on anatomy and how it relates to the ultrasound position, probe position, et cetera. And, and, and these are very 
uh, very useful. And in addition, you should have a standard anatomy textbook, such as a Netter's book, available. Uh, so, because you're often going to be asked to look at something that perhaps you haven't thought of in a, in a long time, or perhaps even ever, if, if, if you're new to this type of imaging. One very useful aspect of MSK ultrasound is you always have the contralateral side for comparison. If you're just doing an MRI of an ankle, you generally do not scan the other ankle. But there's a lot of variability in the MSK system, so it's very nice to be able to pick up the probe and look at the other side. This helps differentiate normal from abnormal. You just, you just have to be aware of bilateral pathology, where especially where one side is asymptomatic. In other words, somebody may have a rotator cuff tear on one side and have an equal sized tear on the other side that doesn't hurt. So you just have to be a little bit careful about this bilateral comparison. Uh, however, it tends to be most helpful when it's asymmetric to, to give, increase your confidence that what you're looking at is in fact an abnormality. Early in my career, this is an example of a contralateral comparison that was, was helpful. So I'm looking at the Achilles tendon here, and the symptomatic side is the left. There, there is a split screen comparing it to the right on the same scale. You can see that the left Achilles tendon is larger than on the other side. It's more hypochoic. It also has increased through transmission compared to the other side. And so if this were the first Achilles you ever looked at, certainly it would be very helpful to pick up the probe compared to the other side and realize that you're actually dealing with an abnormality. As time goes on, you're going to need contralateral comparison less and less, but truth is we use it just about every day in our department because it's very important to know what is normal for that patient. One of the benefits of MSK ultrasound is each type of tissue has its own signature appearance, as I, I've listed here. And we're going to go through the different signature appearances in health and disease for these different types of tissue. So first starting with tendons. So normal tendons have nice parallel lines, parallel collagen fibers, very sort of monotonous like this. And of course, that's going to then tell you what the ultrasound should look like, because when the ultrasound beam hits these fibers, it's going to produce echoes. And so if we look at this longitudinal Achilles tendon, what we see are alternating hyper and hypoechoic lines. See the bright and dark lines here going across the Achilles tendon. And that is the signature of tendons, no matter where we are in the body. Now, when you go transversely on a tendon, it'll have what we call the brush pattern. It's almost like cutting a fiber optic cable in cross section. So where you see those fibers in longitudinal, now when you cut them in cross section, you're going to see these dots, bright and dark dots, that are coming toward us, cross section of a normal Achilles tendon. This happens to be an anterior tibial tendon, again showing that fibrillar pattern. Again, the point I'm just trying to make is that tendons have this signature, so when you see it, you know that's a tendon. Now, one of the very important properties of tendons on ultrasound is anisotropy. Anisotropy is artificially low echogenicity that you see within a structure because the beam is not hitting it at 90 degrees. Because the tendon is such, has a, such a nice parallel arrangement, when you hit it with the ultrasound beam, it hits the fibers, comes back to the probe, and you get an image. But on, the, on our right here, the beam is hitting the probe at an oblique angle. The beam reflects off into a different plane, and this information never gets back to the probe. So the tendon ends up looking black. And that's a problem, because a lot of pathologies look black or hypoechoic, and so we can't know from the picture on the right, if it's abnormal or not. When you see anisotropy in a tendon, the correction is to tilt your probe, what we call heel to toe, tilt the bottom half of the probe, press a little harder with it. Again, this is the same tendon at the same time, and you can see the nice parallel fibers that have returned to the tendon because you now have the correct angle. So this is a property of all tendons, and again, we don't want to confuse it with pathology, so you want to heel to toe the transducer to keep a 90 degree angle to the tendon. So here's some examples. This is the Achilles tendon coming down. And at the insertion, see how it's black here? And the question is, is that an area of tendinosis? Could it be a partial tear? What exactly is happening there? Well, what you need to do is you need to tilt the probe. And when you tilt it and get more perpendicular to this part of the tendon, you can see that there are actually normal fibers in there. So this is tells you that this is normal, and also 
uh, you might say, well, you know, how am I going to know to do this? Yeah, with time, you're going to correct for anisotropy even without realizing that you're doing it. It's also important to realize that anisotropy can occur on transverse images. This is an example of a transverse view at the medial ankle. And we have a sonography school where we are, and our, our students are great, but sometimes they may encounter something that looks like this and perhaps get a little confused on a DVT study. When we rock this probe, however, we can see that these dark areas fill in with that typical brush pattern. So what we're seeing here is an anisotropic posterior tibial tendon and flexor digitorum longus tendon easily corrected by tilting the probe and letting it fill in with echoes. So this is not, in fact, a DVT. Now, anisotropy is also why we want to use linear transducers. Because in a linear transducer, since the beam is parallel, you will get each part of the beam hitting the tendon perpendicularly to make your um, pattern. However, however, if you use something like a curved probe, you can see that the center part of this tendon looks okay. You can see fibers, but the periphery of the tendon looks black because the beam is diverging and bouncing off the edges of this tendon, and that's making it look black. This is, again, same tendon at the same time. So this is why we do not want to use curved probes. We want to use linear probes when we're looking at tendons because of the angle dependence. Okay, now once you know what, an, what a tendon should look like, now we can identify pathology. So here is a typical weekend warrior who felt a very painful pop while playing basketball and started swelling up in the back of the ankle. And what we can see here is the area of the Achilles tendon, but the tendon itself is abnormal. Why? Because we do not see the fibrillar pattern that we associate with tendons. Yes, we do see some fibers here that just kind of come down and end. Then we have this amorphous area, which is essentially a hematoma in this patient who had a complete rupture of the Achilles tendon. Now, this is a partial Achilles tendon tear. This was a runner, um, a marathon runner, who was feeling pain in the ankle. And we can see that this is proximal, and we can see that the fibers are okay here. But then as we go more distally, there's this flame-shaped area that's hypoechoic that kind of then comes to the deep surface of the tendon. So this is a tear that starts within the substance of the tendon and then comes to the deep aspect of the tendon. Very well seen with the, high, uh, with the ultrasound image. Which brings me to the next point, which is we also have Doppler at our disposal. Normal tendons do not have any color Doppler within them. So when you see color Doppler flow, it tells you two things. One is that that tendon is abnormal. And the second thing it tells you is that it's most likely the cause of the patient's pain. So when we put this uh, Doppler on in this patient, we can see the flow going into the tendon, and that was the cause of her pain. Rotator cuff is a specialized tendon in its structure, and not going to go through it in, in detail, but just, just to mention that there have been, there's quite a bit of literature now showing ultrasound is as accurate as MRI for rotator cuff tears. And I'll just show a couple just a normal and, and then a couple abnormals, but that could be a separate lecture in and of itself. But the rotator cuff tends to, instead of having a nice parallel arrangement like Achilles, tends to have these fibers bundle, uh, uh, kind of in bundles that have kind of a striated appearance. And the whole tendon, rather than being a flat tendon, has what we call a bird's beak appearance. This is its attachment to the greater tuberosity. This is the humeral head, and we get toward the muscle on this side, of the, our right side of the screen. So this is what a normal rotator cuff looks like. And, and then it becomes not too difficult to see a full thickness tear where we've lost that bird's beak, which has now been filled in with fluid and debris. This is cartilage lining the bone, which has now been exposed by this full thickness tear of the tendon. We can actually also see even partial tears pretty well. This is, a, again, a bird's beak. The whole beak isn't uh, torn, but there is a tear of the deep fibers of the tendon with associated bony irregularity here on the humerus. So that is a partial articular surface rotator cuff tear. So again, quite good both for full thickness tears and to a lesser extent, but still very good for partial thickness tears. The next big tendon pathology we encounter is tendinosis. And in common usage, people will talk about tendonitis, but, but, but tendonitis means inflammation of the tendon. 
when we see a lot of chronic conditions that people get, such as tennis elbow, Achilles problems, etc., these tend not to be inflammatory conditions. They tend to be degenerative conditions, so what we call tendinosis. And you'll see what happens in tendinosis. Dis disorganized collagen, mucoid degeneration, vessels that grow in, necrosis, cartilage formation, calcifications, and interstitial tearing. But there's one notable absence from this list, and that's inflammation. Because in most of these conditions, inflammation is, does not have a role. That's why we say tendinosis rather than tendinitis. On ultrasound, because of those pathologic genes I just showed you, that the tendon will thicken up because of the scar tissue and mucoid degeneration within it. It'll get heterogeneous. You may see nodular hypoechoic areas corresponding to the degenerated areas. Calcifications can occur, which of course will look bright. Interstitial splitting and increased Doppler flow, but that's variable. They don't always show it, but it's something that is a common finding in tendinosis. So here is an insertional Achilles tendinosis. Right where the Achilles comes down to the bone, you can see that it's very thick, very heterogeneous. It's not a full thickness tear like I showed you before because the fibers are still there. It's just that they're separated by this degenerated material. There's a calcification in there. There's a partial tear in there. And there's random blood flow in there as well. And this is a typical uh, tendinosis of the distal Achilles. Calcifications, when they occur within a tendon, look like calcifications elsewhere in the body. They tend to be very bright. And depending on how large they are and how thick they are, or how um, hard they are, I should probably say, they may or may not shadow the beam. This happens to be the gluteus medius, one of the tendons of the lateral thigh. The bone is down here. More superficially, you see this very bright shadowing structure. And here's the plain film carlet showing a calcification sitting within the tendon right on top of the bone. And that's what's causing the acoustic shadowing. Here's a calcification within the rotator cuff, very, very common. Again, echogenic with posterior acoustic shadowing. Now, sometimes the echogenic areas will be either too small or too soft to create a shadow. So this is a patient who has calcific tendinosis, which is symptomatic, but you see no shadowing. You just see the bright foci, probably because they're too small to shadow. This is probably even under a millimeter, but, you can, but uh, that doesn't mean they're not calcium. So beware that they don't always shadow. Sometimes this tendinosis can get re really severe, and you can see why it can be so debilitating. This is a patellar tendon below the patella, which is labeled here. See how incredibly thick and, and heterogeneous this is with, with even interstitial, uh, interstitial tearing, very heterogeneous, hypoechoic, and look at all the flow as well. So these conditions really can be very difficult to treat sometimes. Now, tendon sheaths. Tendon sheaths, their job in life is to lubricate the motion of the tendons. And they look as a, they appear as a hypoechoic halo around tendons. They may contain a small amount of fluid because, again, they're, they have a lubrication role, so the, the little bit of fluid helps with that. There are some tendons that have no sheaths, the most notable being the Achilles. So rather than having a hypoechoic sheath, the Achilles has a hyperechoic paratenon. Here's an example of what we call tenosynovitis, inflammation of the tendon sheath. This is the posterior tibial tendon in the ankle. You can see the fibrillar pattern. It's a little bit hypoechoic, but really the main abnormality here is that there's too much fluid you can have a tiny bit of dependent fluid in a tendon sheath in the ankle, but this is way too much. It's both in front of the tendon, behind the tendon. When we put on the Doppler, you can see there's flow mostly around the tendon, not much in it. And that is tenosynovitis, inflammation of the tendon sheath. So in this case, it is inflammation. That's why we see itis. Um, and that is something that, uh, again, can be quite painful. Okay, so moving on from tendons to joints. Obviously, the anatomy of joints will be specific to the body part being examined. And what we do is we learn the best acoustic window to see effusions for each joint. And uh, I'll just show you just a couple of com common examples, hip, knee, and shoulder. Um, hip, we look anteriorly at the joint capsule. And you can see this is the way the probe is aligned. And we have femoral head and femoral neck. And then this is fluid, which is lifting up the anterior joint capsule. It tends to collect right here at the head-neck junction because that's where the 
the biggest potential spaces of the joint. So that's where we look when we're aspirating a hip and also where we look when we want to do an injection. We tend to aim for that area right in there. For knee joints, we place the probe at the superior pole of the patella and translate it back and forth. At that view, you'll see the quadriceps tendon. Then you'll see two fat pads, the suprapatellar fat pad and the prefemoral fat pad, which are separated by this oblique line, which is the suprapatellar recess of the joint. And that's what it looks like normally. You can usually see it normally even if it doesn't have fluid. But when it does have fluid, it becomes relatively easy here because now we see that line has been distended up by fluid, some debris, which is separating our fat pads above the patella. Again, here's the quadriceps tendon anteriorly. And this is an extended field of view showing that you can follow the quad muscles down to their tendon, the effusion, the patella, the infrapatellar tendon, femur, tibia. So this slide is just here to remind me that if you have extended field of view technology on your machine, it's very useful because it's helpful not only in showing large pathologies and measuring them accurately, but also it can be important in uh, communication to, your, to the surgeon to, so that you can show more anatomy and they can know exactly what they're dealing with. Now when we're looking for shoulder effusions, another common area we look at, we look for this anatomy, we place the probe posteriorly at the uh, glenohumeral joint. About, it's about, it lies about two-thirds of the way up between the axillary fold, that fold sort of under your, your armpit, and the top of the shoulder. If you go about two-thirds of the way up, you'll, that is where you'll see the shoulder joint posteriorly. We can see here the humeral head, the glenoid, and um, this is the infraspinatus muscle, the deltoid, and the arrow is pointing to the posterior glenoid labrum. This is a patient who did not have an effusion. Okay, and then this is somebody with an effusion. You can see here's fluid that's lifting up this thickened capsule. The labrum is degenerated, essentially it's gone. And again, from the posterior approach, that's where you can aspirate. That's also where you can inject a shoulder. Ankle joint, we place the probe as shown and translate it back and forth. We're looking for the tibia and we're looking for the talus. The one thing that's important is do not confuse this hypoechoic line, which is the articular cartilage of the dome of the talus. Do not co confuse that for fluid because, as I'll show you in a little while, the cartilage that lines joints is hypoechoic. And, and when it hugs the bone like this, it's normal. But when you have an effusion, it'll form a teardrop. And this patient had acute ankle trauma and had bleeding, a bloody effusion into the tibiotalar joint forming this teardrop kind of uh, shape. Okay, now moving on to bursas. There are bursas all over the body. I'll just quickly touch upon three of the most common that we see. The most common we usually see is the popliteal or Baker's cyst. It's very important to recognize that this represents fluid in the gastrocnemius semimembranosus bursa, which is at the medial popliteal fossa. It communicates with the joint in well over 50% of adults. So it's important because pathologies that occur in the knee can manifest themselves in a Baker cyst. So it's, it's an important structure. Also important, you'll run into it a lot when you do DVT studies, and uh, it's important not to confuse it with something else. So this is uh, Baker cyst, and the anatomy of Baker cyst is that you have the semimembranosus tendon and you have the medial head of the gastroc shown by these arrows. The deep part of the cyst will communicate with the knee joint more often than not, and then the superficial part grows up like this into sort of a mushroom shape. Here you can see a little bit of debris in this one too, because if the knee has debris, the Baker cyst will get debris since they often communicate. It is this anatomy you should see every time when you, when you identify a Baker cyst. So, just seeing something cystic behind the knee does not equal Baker cyst. You have to show this anatomy to be confident you're looking at a Baker cyst and not something different, like a cystic tumor, for example. This is the iliopsoas bursa, which lives behind the common femoral artery and common femoral vein. When might you bump into this? You may bump into it when you're doing a DVT study, for example, because just like the Baker cyst has fluid draining into it from the knee, the iliopsoas bursa has fluid draining in to it from the hip joint, and that can cause this somewhat confusing appearance. But that is uh, the iliocellus bursa. And then the retocalcaneal bursa is another common one we see, 
with the Achilles tendon coming down. This is a patient actually who had rheumatoid arthritis and had pain at the posterior heel. Uh, the Achilles is a little bit thickened and the bone's a little irregular, but there's also this pocket of fluid and debris here, which when we put on the color Doppler actually had some flow at its periphery. There's also some flow in the distal Achilles. Here's a bony erosion on the posterior calcaneus. So this is somebody who had a retrocalcaneal bursitis from rheumatoid arthritis. So again, bursas, similar to tendon sheets, they, their job is a lubricatory uh, function, but when they become inflamed or enlarged, that's when they can cause symptoms. Now, the ganglion is a synovium-like structure. It's lined by a synovium-like uh, lining. And these can occur in association with joints or tendon sheets or ligaments or even nerves. And what they are are this thick debris, fluid kind of debris that forms into this pocket. And they can present as a painful lump or they can be painless as well depending on size and location. This is how they look on an MRI. This is how they look on ultrasound, although they can sometimes have more echoes with them when they have debris. The key difference between the MRI and the ultrasound, of course, is you can stick a needle uh, at the same time you're doing the ultrasound. Uh, not, and, and so you can take the study from just being a diagnostic to being a therapeutic one. And that's, of course, one of the real powers of ultrasound, having the patient there with the real-time capability to intervene if you need to. Okay, moving to muscles. How do they look? Well, <clears throat> muscles look as hypoechoic muscle bundles separated by hyperechoic fibroadipose septa. On longitudinal scans, they have a so-called pennate architecture. They look like veins in a leaf. On transverse scans, it's been said that muscles have a starry night pattern. So here is a normal vastus lateralis muscle in the thigh. We can see the hypoechoic muscle bundles separated by the hyperechoic fibroadipose septa, again, somewhat reminiscent of veins in a, in a leaf. If you turn the probe perpendicularly, this is where you get the starry night pattern. So you can see how you know, the dark sky here being the muscle fibers, the, the stars, so to speak, being the, the septa that are, you're now cutting in cross-section, and those, that, that cross-section creates that starry sky appearance in transverse. Now, not so much as tendons, but muscles can have anisotropy as well. This is somebody who had a painful um, latissimus dorsi muscle, and I saw this and I thought, oh, that looks like it could be a, a muscle tear. But then I rocked the probe, and that became bright, and the rest of the muscle became dark. So, oh, okay, it's not pathologic, it's actually normal. So, remember that um, you should always be checking for anisotropy whenever you're thinking of calling pathology, because sometimes you'll be surprised. So always make sure that before you call a hypoechoic abnormality that you've tilted the probe into whatever angles you have to to show that it's not simply anisotropy. Okay, so again, we saw normal muscle and, when is, and now when is it abnormal? When we lose that penate pattern. So this is somebody who's playing tennis, felt a pop in the calf, and the penate architecture is gone and replaced by this amorphous hematoma. So the whole medial head of the gastrocnemius rupture, this is the intact soleus muscle deep to it for comparison. This is a partial tear. Somebody who was dancing at a party felt a, a pop, you know, swelling, a little bit of, of bruising. And this is the gastroc muscle, and you can see it pulled away from the fascial attachment. So this would be a partial tear of the medial head of the gastroc. Moving on to peripheral nerves. Peripheral nerves have an extremely well-seen internal structure, especially with modern equipment. They're similar to tendons, but they differ in a couple important ways. Uh, they're less tightly packed, and they have less anisotropy. Rather than the fibrillar pattern that you see in tendons, peripheral nerves have fascicles, or nerve bundles, that are separated and surrounded by connect connective tissue, um, epineurium being the main thing that we see. Uh, the main part of the connective tissue that is visible by ultrasound as something hyperechoic. So the fascicles are hypoechoic and the connective tissue is hyperechoic, similar to like in a muscle, for example. This is a histologic slide showing what a nerve looks like. And so these are the, the fascicles and the pink staining material here separating the fascicles is the connective tissue. 
Now, as the machines get better and better, it's really quite amazing how well we're seeing this anatomy. Uh, this is the short axis of a media nerve with, with a, an over 20 megahertz transducer. And literally, you can count every fascicle in this nerve on cross-section. And on top of it is the palmaris longus tendon, which, which shows you the difference between tendon and nerve. Again, uh, the tendon being more tightly packed fibrillar, the nerve being fascicular, the nerve fascicles showing up. And then when you go on long axis, ditto, you see the tightly packed tendon on top of these hypoechoic bundles that are moving through the nerve separated by connective tissue. Now, when nerves get abnormal and become edematous, that separation between the fascicles can start to be obliterated. And this is somebody with carpal tunnel syndrome where the nerve was compressed within the wrist. And when a nerve gets compressed, there's usually a normal amount of fluid that circulates within the nerve. If you compress the nerve, it's sort of like putting a dam on a river. The fluid starts to back up, and you will lose that fascicular pattern. So you can see this nerve, it's become very hypoechoic, hard to separate the fascicles. It's also enlarged. It's about twice the normal size of a median nerve. And then if we go into the long axis to see the cause, we can see what's happening. Here's the nerve coming down, proximal to distal, and distally as it goes into the wrist, it's being compressed right at the level of the arrows by the, the um, flexor retinaculum in the wrist, and that is what's causing the patient's symptoms and, of course, causing the nerve to swell up in this patient with clinical symptoms of carpal tunnel syndrome. And these nerve compressions can be all over the body, and, and, um, and this happens to be cubital tunnel syndrome. This is an ulnar nerve at the elbow that's lost its vesicular pattern, and that is, again, showing that we can see these swollen nerves and confirm clinical diagnoses of entrapment syndromes all over the body. Now, this, this slide uh, tells me um, to, to, reminds me to tell you that one of the beauties of nerve imaging is that we are not limited to any one body segment. This patient presented with signs and symptoms of tibial neuropathy, and if you're not easily localizing it by physical examination, it may become very hard to understand where you should do an MRI, for example. But the beauty of ultrasound is you can just follow the whole tibial nerve, and that's what we did, and eventually we ran into this mass. And we could see that there were nerve fibers going in and out of this mass, so this was a neurofibroma of the tibial nerve, a schwannoma, another variant can look just like this. But the key thing is that you know it's nerve and etiology because of the nerve exiting and enter, entering and exiting it. And uh, it also has a typical appearance of nerve masses. They tend to be very hypoechoic, and they may have some increased through transmission as well. Again, the through transmission doesn't mean they're cystic. Superficial masses often will show through transmission even if solid. All right, now moving to ligaments. So remember, ligaments connect bone to bone. Uh, they are of intermediate echogenicity. They're not as bright as calcium, not as dark as fluid. They're kind of right in the middle. They're identified by the bones they connect, because that's their job, is to connect bones. And so this is the anterior talofibular ligament. This is the distal fibula. This is the talus. And the only reason I know that this is that ligament is because it's labeled on the slide. I mean, a ligament is, you tend to need to know where your probe is to know what ligament you're looking at. But that is, connect, its job is to connect bone to bone to prevent them from coming apart. Now, this is where the beauty of ultrasound is a dynamic study really comes in with ligaments, because if the ligament's job is to hold bones together, then you may not really appreciate how abnormal the problem is until you try to stress the ligament. This is somebody who had a history of a sprain of the anterior talofibular ligament at the anterior lateral ankle, and this is the most common ligament that, that when we sprain an ankle, this is the ligament that's most commonly sprained. And they were still having pain several months after the incident. Here's the distal fibula, here's the talus, and this is the ligament. Or is it? I mean, there's some fluid here. How can we explain the type of pain this patient's in and the fact they can hardly walk? Well, let's put some stress along that ligament. And when we do, we see that the ligament completely retracts, and all this fluid rushes in in between these torn edges, torn edge here, torn edge here. So at the at rest, it looked like it could actually be intact, only when we stress it. 
we realize that not only is the ligament torn, but there's instability at that air level, and that explains why the patient has so much pain and difficulty walking. So whenever I'm looking for ligaments, I always try to stress them to see whether they're doing their job. Next type of structure as we continue our tour of uh, the normal structures on MSK ultrasound is fibrocartilage. Fibrocartilage is echogenic. MRI is often the test of choice for fibrocartilage because these structures often lie within deep within joints. However, if ultrasound finds an abnormality, it, it's very, the positive predictive value is high. So if you see a labral tear in the hip or a meniscal tear in the knee, if you see it on ultrasound, then you can call it with confidence. Uh, it's just that some of the tears of these structures will be too deep to see by ultrasound. And that's where MRI may have to come into play. So here's a couple examples. This is a normal hip labrum. So to orient you, this is the acetabulum. This is the femoral head. We're looking in long axis here. And this triangular structure is a normal hip labrum. Again, it's fibrocartilage is kind of intermediate in echogenicity. Now what happens when the labrum tears? You can see that it's lost its echogenicity. There's a fluid gap between the labrum and the bone there. And there's sort of this complex tear running through the labrum. So even though we don't see the entire labrum in everybody, if we see something like this, we know that it's abnormal. And we can call it with confidence. OK, next, hyaline cartilage. So I alluded to this before, that it lines articular surfaces. It's hypoechoic. And it may mimic fluid because it's so hypoechoic. This is hyaline cartilage at the femoral trochlear notch. So if you bend the knee all the way up and place the probe right on top of the kneecap, this is a picture that you'll get. So this is the femur. This is the part of the femur that, that uh, articulates with the patella. And this is hyaline cartilage, hypoechoic cartilage, that's completely lining this bone. So it's not fluid. It's lining the bone perfectly. It's cartilage. Well, it turns out that we can see cartilage abnormalities quite well. So this is somebody who had knee pain, had an MRI that was unrevealing. We took the patient to ultrasound, and we see several things. First of all, rather than being very hypoechoic, the cartilage has echoes within it. That implies that it has edema in it. And there's an erosion. There's an area here where the cartilage has totally gone away, and you just have fluid on top of bone. We went back to the MRI. It all looked kind of high signal in here, but you just had no idea of the degree of cartilage loss that there was. Why? Because of the high resolution that ultrasound gives you. OK, now bones. Bones are brightly echogenic lines with acoustic shadowing. I learned early in my career that don't ignore bones, because they can provide important information. You may see unsuspected stress fractures. You may see degenerative changes. And you may see erosions from rheumatic disease or osteomyelitis. This is a woman who had persistent shoulder pain six months after a car accident. It's a relatively old case because I show it because this is the case that really showed me that I should really respect the bones. So this woman, at the time of her accident, had an x-ray that was negative. She could not have an MRI because she was very claustrophobic, and she was in persistent pain. So they ordered an ultrasound. We did not find a rotator cuff tear. Then the patient said, I hurt back here. And she pointed. And we placed the probe down, humeral head, humeral head, and then there was this piece of bone that was depressed. So this was an unsuspected humeral impaction fracture. These are very hard to see on x-ray. And like I said, she couldn't have an MRI. So ultrasound here saved the day because you could see this abnormality. And she could then be treated properly. Rib fractures, ultrasound is about three times more sensitive than x-ray for rib fractures. This is a woman who had lupus and was on steroids, so she was at high risk for bony problems. And she was shoveling her snow, and she felt chest pain. She went to the ER, and they ruled her out for an MI and for pulmonary embolism. They did a rib series that was negative. And she was about to embark on a very extensive workup until somebody had the idea, well, you know, let me take a look with ultrasound, see if we see something there. A non-tender rib, and here's a tender rib. And you can see there's a crack right there, a non-displaced fracture of the rib. And she actually had four rib fractures, two on each side, that were very painful. Now, you might say, well, you don't really do anything about rib fractures, and that's true. But again, remember, she was about to embark on a pretty extensive workup. So it was very important to have the workup end here and just say, nope, you've got these rib fractures. You're going to be fine. Nothing else going on. Another 
modality that's about three times uh, better for um, pathology is when we're looking at ultrasound for rheumatic erosions, rheumatoid erosions. Again, we see about three times as many erosions in ultrasound as you do on x-ray in about three times the number of patients. So this is a patient who had rheumatoid arthritis, had um, erosions here on the neck of the metacarpal. Here's the metacarpal head and the proximal thongs. So deep erosions, a lot of flow within very thick synovium, but uh, her x-ray was read as normal. Um, maybe a little osteopenia, but certainly I mean, on ultrasound, every single one of her fingers looked like this. Yet on x-ray, you had no idea the type of pathology that was lurking. And of course, this is critical in how you treat the patient. Foreign bodies has been traditionally a very good use of ultrasound because many foreign bodies are radiolucent and do not show up on an x-ray and uh, ultrasound to the rescue there. So this is somebody who stepped on a wooden plank and thought she got a splinter out of her foot, but, but uh, several weeks later she still had pain and swelling in the foot. So this is a foreign body within the subdermal tissue. Here's the dermis here, so it's, it's embedded in the plantar aspect of her foot. The whole foot was very swollen, and so the surgeon wanted me to mark the foreign body right before surgery so that he would know exactly where to operate. And he showed me the intraoperative pictures and so this is my mark on the skin. And you can see he only had to make a very small incision because of my mark uh, instead of having to explore the whole area. This is the tip of the foreign body. And then here's the foreign body being pulled out. And uh, he sent me these in part, in part just to thank me for, for having him have to make such a small incision to get the foreign body out. But in truth, this is really something that is, is a very use, you know, known use of ultrasound very, very, uh, for many years. And remember that foreign bodies may not necessarily be, you know, something wood or something metal. They could also be something a surgeon put in. This is a, pain who had, a patient who had pain after surgery to repair a humeral fracture and was having very severe pain. And we can see this structure poking into the rotator cuff. This is a screw with the threads here poking into the rotator cuff. So no wonder the patient was in such pain because this patient had this hardware that was going directly into a tendon. Okay, now I talked before about how important the dynamic examination is because pathology may not be apparent at rest, so you want to use maneuvers to elicit the pathology. So you, what I basically do is I ask the patient to reproduce the symptoms and then I take a look and see what's going on. So this was a softball pitcher with a painful click while throwing. She was a right-handed fast pitch softball pitcher. And she had had an x-ray that was negative, she had an MRI that was negative. But it was bothering her so much she couldn't pitch. This is her pitching arm and the contralateral side for comparison. So this is the capitellum, the distal part of the humerus, and then the radial head. Not much to see, not much asymmetry. But she had no problems at rest. So what we had her do is we had her simulate her pitching motion and we held on for dear life with our ultrasound probe until we tried to reproduce the symptoms. I just said, when you feel the click, say now. So she said now and went back, froze the image, went back on cine loop. And when she said now, the humeral, um, I'm sorry, the radial head subluxated. It quickly snapped out and back into the joint. And that was the snap that she was feeling. And it occurred almost too quick even for the eye to see. So we're able to diagnose that she had an injury, a ligamentous injury, annular ligament injury to the elbow, which could not be seen on MRI. Again, it's the dynamic aspect of ultrasound that allows you to make such a diagnosis. The only other imaging test that could potentially show this would be a, uh, a fluoroscopy, but of course that's radiation. In a 16-year-old, you'd rather avoid that if possible. And then this case is another case that really shows the use, and it's a little bit uh, a little bit grainy image here, but when I play the video, you'll see it clearly. What's happening in this patient is that she had a soccer injury and could not, could barely even walk anymore. And she had an MRI, and they called tenosynovitis, inflammation around the perineal tendon sheet. So these are the perineal tendons behind the fibula. Now I'm going to put this in motion, and you're going to see what's going to happen here. The tendons are okay at rest, but when I flex her ankle, notice how the tendons come up over the bone. In fact, there are now three tendons because the, this tendon has split into two, the peroneus brevis. The peroneus longus has stayed behind. 
And so if you just took an MRI in this position, you're going to have no idea of how severe this pathology is. The patient completely ruptured the retinaculum, which is the ligament that holds in these tendons, and had to have this area reconstructed. Again, it's the dynamic imaging that really makes the diagnosis. Now, this is a 68-year-old who, who ran in the Senior Olympics. And he had posterior foot and ankle pain, and the script said, rule out Achilles tear. So we looked at the Achilles, and there were calcifications and uh, an enthesophyte, which is a bone spur at the tendon attachment here. And OK, so the sonographer showed me the images, and I went in to say hello to the patient. And he said something interesting. He said, you know, you, you guys still have not found the area of pain. And so I pushed on the Achilles, and he had zero pain on his Achilles. So I said, where is the pain? And he pointed laterally. And what he was pointing to were the perineal tendons, and there was a split tear of the perineus brevis tendon right here. And this was where he was tender. So I found it very interesting because, again, the script said rule out Achilles tear. You don't know when you're reading an MRI that it's not the Achilles that at all that's tender. And if he had gone to MRI first, they would have probably missed this tear. Or they may have seen it, but they may have downplayed it since the script said to look for the Achilles. So this shows you the value of ultrasound to correlate the imaging directly with where the patient hurts. Now, before we conclude, we will talk about some disadvantages of ultrasound versus MRI. Of course, operator dependence. But that implies that MRI is not operator dependent, which it is. So it really, it's not something that you can learn in a weekend, but it's something that if you devote yourself to, then you can, you can learn it and learn to do it well. Internal derangement of joints, because the pathologies are often deep, MRI is usually better for those. Bone marrow processes, such as bone marrow edema, tumors and fractures, although we see some of, of uh, tumors and fractures on ultrasound, uh, MRI is often gives a better uh, overall view. And of course, the central nervous system and adult spine is MRI all the way. Advantages, well, every patient can have an ultrasound. They prefer it. There was a nice article out of Wash U in St. Louis where they gave surveys to patients, and they vastly preferred ultrasound of the shoulder over MRI. It has better resolution than MRI. You can do easy contralateral comparisons. You can do real-time dynamic studies. You can place the probe exactly where it hurts and correlate the findings to the symptoms. Doppler capability, which gives you physiologic information that's unique and, of course, becomes very important, especially in, in, in the rheumatology world. And interventions, which is a whole other lecture in and of itself. But suffice it to say that the superior depiction of pathologies that you can see on ultrasound open up a whole world of interventions you can then perform. Well, thank you very much for my, your attention. This is where I work at Thomas Jefferson University Hospital in Philadelphia. And, uh, I want to thank you again for listening to this webinar, and uh, I hope that if you are doing musculoskeletal ultrasound already, that this will help you push it further, and if you're new to the field, that this will inspire you to take it up, because it really is very, very beneficial to the patient. Okay, thank you very much, and I'll take any questions. Okay, so I have questions here. So. The first question says, do you have any good pictures of what adhesions and scarring look in the muscles after surgery, say through the abdominal wall muscles? I do not in this particular lecture, but you can see disruption of muscle architecture on ultrasound in somebody who has had surgery. And yes, you can actually see scarring. And that can be very important. For example, it can direct where physical therapy could be done, and it even can go in sometimes with a needle, and break up some of that scar tissue as well. So yes, you can absolutely see it. Okay, next question. How does a joint replacement change your evaluation of joint? Ah, okay. A very nice and separate lecture that I have in my, <laughs> in my arsenal. It changes it differently in different places. The two most, the, actually the three most common places that we see joint replacement ultrasounds are shoulder, hip, and knee. The shoulder, uh, what you have to remember is that the main thing that they're interested in is, in is the rotator cuff intact. So you want to make sure that that cuff covers the replaced shoulder and attaches to its normal place on the tuberosities. In the hip, 
the hip uh, joint itself is usually deep to the pathologies that we're, we see, and usually there, very commonly, we're looking for either, let's say, something in the hip joint, such as an effusion or an infection. We also want to see whether there's any impingement or bursitis involved in the iliopsoas, among other things. And then the knee, ditto, we're looking for fluid, synovitis, or perhaps a tendon tear about the knee. So it does change the way the pictures look, but many of the pathologies we look for are the same pathologies we look at in a native joint. Okay, next. Any advice to differentiate small effusions from hyaline cartilage? Yes. Um, one thing you can do is you can push with the probe. So effusions will move and dissipate, or you can change perhaps the, 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 the um, angle of the joint a little bit, and that might help you tell the difference. But again, if you just felt, if you just met with a static image, it's, if you see it completely hug the bone, you should think hyaline cartilage first, and if you can't make it dissipate by pushing on it um, or make a change in that way, then it probably is cartilage. If you can make a change or dissipate, then it's fluid. Okay, next question. Have you heard of PTs during MS Calf Center? You bet, I have. And um, we have even some who have taught at some of our courses. The, um, I've seen a whole range of people who do very limited scope to people who do a little bit more. And so if you are a PT, it is something that um, if you have, I, I usually find that the best thing is a, is a team approach, PT, physician working together, you can, um, you can get very nice results that way. So yes, absolutely they do. Um, next question is how realistic is it to do point of care ultrasound providers to diagnose tendinopathies using bedside ultrasound machines? It is realistic, but you have to make sure that the machine is a good enough quality. There are some machines out there that are so um, bargain basement, so to speak, that you're just not going to get a good picture. But we have, there are some excellent compact ultrasound machines that give you really, really nice pictures of tendinopathies. So it absolutely is realistic. It's absolutely realistic, for example, to run on, run on a football field and, uh, and scan a player who's down. Absolutely it's realistic with the improvements in compact technologies over the years. Um, okay, next. Any use of MSK ultrasound in combination with Doppler to look on, um, for arterial and venous flow or not really? Um, yes. So in color Doppler, of course, you only know that there's flow there, right? But you don't know if it's arterial and venous. So if you can then go ahead and put on the spectral Doppler, you can tell arterial and venous flow. Where is this important? This is important if you're trying to decide if something's a tumor or not. because So you want to determine, is, is the flow I'm seeing, is it arterial or not? How much flow is there in it? It can also be helpful if you have a, um, a vascular malformation that you're trying to characterize, how much flow and what type of flow. Uh, certainly, it can be very helpful to have your Doppler, um, Doppler on. So, so that, is, that is useful for sure. OK, next question. Do you routinely look for anterior impingement over the coracohumeral ligament, as well as subacromial. Okay, so subacromial we always look for subacromial impingement. Coracol, um, coracoid impingement we do look for as well. In fact, we wrote an article on it. If you want to look it up, it's in uh, it was published in um, in Journal of Ultrasound Medicine a few uh, few years ago. Um, first author I believe is Tui on that T U O H Y I believe. In any event, yes, you can absolutely look for coracoid impingement. And um, it's not as common as subacromial impingement, but if you adduct the arm across the chest, you'll see in that article that we mentioned some measurements that we do to try to decide whether they have impingement there. Do you recommend any MS, specific MSK study materials? Where there's some very good books out there, and there's some good um, online materials too. So if you're just starting out, that ESSR.org the, uh, website, um, those those uh, PDFs that they have of their scanning techniques are all over the internet. You'll be able to find them. Um, plus, it's good to get a good book. Um, this is a CME course, so I can't hawk commercial products, but suffice it to say that there's some good books there. Um, if you go onto Amazon, there's some nice simple uh, textbooks. I have no financial um, disclosures to make on any of these, so I'll tell you that one that many people use is by John Jacobson from University of Michigan. It's a, it's, I see a lot of my sonographers using it, and they like it a lot. But there are other good ones out there as well. 
Questions about elastography. Okay, so elastography is one of the holy grails of MSK imaging because many of the pathologies that we see are problems not only where the anatomy gets disrupted, but also the, the, the tension or thickness or hardness of the tissue gets disrupted. For example, you can start to see tendons degenerate maybe before the grayscale changes because you may see them soften on elastography. So that is the good news. Now, the bad news is, or I should at least say the challenge, is that elastography is very subject to anisotropy. So it tends to work better in muscles which are not as anisotropic than it does in tendons. That being said, though, straight tendons like the Achilles, um, you'll probably do better than in the rotator cuff. But as the technology keeps getting better and better for elastography, I am hoping that we can really get to a good point there. Because again, not only will it help us find pathology, but it will also help us follow patients after we do treatments, whether it be treatments such as physical therapy or invasive treatments that we do under ultrasound guidance. OK, and I believe I have gotten through the list of questions. And a couple of people said, thank you, and you're welcome. <laughs> and, um, but I got through all the, uh, all the questions here. So again, thank you very much for your attention. I appreciate it. Great, and thanks, our thanks very much to you, Dr. Nazarian, and to everyone who participated today. Everyone, please remember to complete the post-test and the activity evaluation. We hope you enjoyed today's presentation, and will join us again in the future. Thanks. Enjoy the rest of your day.